Hi, I'm Tyra G, your host of Frankly Speaking with Tyra G. Welcome again to our virtual global gathering of phenomenal women and all of you who love them. Yes, mothers, daughters, grand and great grandmothers, fearsome and generous, humble and honest in pursuit of new possibilities and purpose. Here we, we dig deep and we come up strong. For those of you joining us for the first time, each month we explore a new theme inspired by you. Yep, I said you. We bravely walk into places where tradition has taught us that there's some things that we just don't talk about, but not at this table. No matter how hard judgment knocks, it will not get in. Beloved here, we're living beyond the wreckage. Every week we experience, educate, encourage, and empower each other. We share some aha moments and stories that have been left in our pockets for far too long. Every week, we start right where we are. I gotta tell you, I am celebrating. We are in month 10 of Frankly Speaking with Tyra Jean. Now all that is, is a dream come true. But I couldn't do it without you. I thank God for every remembrance of your kindness, your thoughts, your creativity, and your support. I couldn't do this without you. I really don't want to. You're listening to Radio Fairfax, Fairfax, Virginia on your TV, computer, or mobile device, and we are webcast every week worldwide on the internet at www.radiofairfax.org. Should you miss us, have that hot date, or that dinner engagement, or that graduation party, that's okay. Check us out on YouTube. Just key in, frankly speaking, with Tyra G. And if you want to have a one-on-one with me, that's easy too. It's Tyra. TyraGarlington.com. Thank you so much for listening in. And thank you, Courtney Nero, for composing and performing our theme for Frankly Speaking with Tyra G. And for naming it very creatively, I'm listening. Our theme these two months has been and is Courageous Conversations. Two big words, both beginning with a C and sometimes uncomfortable to do. For some of us to get a return on an investment, we're going to have to authentically show up and be willing to be vulnerable. We're actually going to have to be perfectly imperfect and to receive and love the information that happens in the next 58 minutes. We're going to talk about issues that may be uncomfortable to think about, deal with, anticipate, and forgive. We're going to contemplate, evaluate, learn about, be surprised, and celebrate. But guess what we're figuring out? Information is both an offense and a defense. This past two months, you and I and our special guests have explored topics like issues and relationships relating to breast cancer, surviving it not once but twice, intergenerational caregiving of a senior with a disability, a developmental disability, a mother's unwaving pursuit to get her daughter back from sex trafficking, Fairfax County's leadership to prevent and end homelessness. An ex-convict discussed her journey into her current status a role model and mentor. We have talked about the protection and or lack thereof for victims of domestic violence. What we've all discovered and agreed to during all of these shows is the fact that the ability to have a courageous conversation is not an event. Sometimes it's a journey. Sometimes we have to walk into a comfort zone And sometimes courageous conversations happen in and stay in our minds and our hearts. Sometimes courageous conversations are dressed in silence. You know, there are always times for each and every one of us to have a season where we require courage, courage to take the next step, courage to say the next word, courage to walk away. 
And sometimes we let fear and shame and guilt demonize our potential to overcome. But, but for now, for today, we're going to pause in a place where we can be a mirror for one another. Our goal is going to be to better understand the topics that don't make it into polite conversations or at the dinner table. I want to open the door to our common thought space today with a blog I wrote two years ago. It will introduce our topic, and I hope it will open the compassion of your heart. And I quote, Do you have a special needs child? My friend does. And I watched her accept the news and then wait. I realized what a wonderful person she was. She defined her special need child as a priceless blessing and she was the perfect steward. I wanted to support her in every possible way. However, I needed more information. I was inspired by the following article from a mother raising a child with intellectual disabilities. Emily Pearl Kingsley wrote this article to provide and encourage an alternative perspective. The title is Welcome to Holland. I'm often asked to describe the experience of raising a child with a disability, to try to help people who have not shared that unique experience to understand it, to imagine how it would feel. Well, it's like this. When you're going to have a baby, it's like planning a fabulous vacation trip to Italy. You buy a bunch of guidebooks and you make your wonderful plans, the Colosseum, the Michelangelo David, the gondolas in Venice. You may learn some handy phrases in Italian. It's all very exciting. After months of eager anticipation, the day finally arrives. You pack your bags and off you go. Several hours later, the plane lands. The stewardess comes in and says, welcome to Holland. Holland, you say? What do you mean, Holland? I signed up for Italy. I'm supposed to be in Italy. All my life, I've dreamed of going to Italy. But there's been a change in your flight plan. They've landed in Holland, and there you must stay. The important thing is that they haven't taken you to a horrible, disgusting, filthy place full of pestilence, famine, and disease. It's just a different place. So you must go out and buy new guidebooks. You must learn a a whole new language and you must meet a whole new group of people you would have never met. It's just a different place. It's slower paced than Italy, less flashy than Italy. But after you've been there for a while and you catch your breath, you look around and you begin to notice that Holland has windmills and Holland has tulips. Holland even has Rembrandts. But everyone you know is busy coming and going from Italy and they're all bragging about what a wonderful time they had. And for the rest of your life you will say, yes, that's where I was supposed to go. That's what I had planned. And the pain of what of that will never, ever, ever go away. Because the loss of a dream is a very significant loss. But If you spend your life mourning the fact that you didn't get to go to Italy, you may never be free to enjoy the very special, the very lovely things about Holland. After hearing Emily's article, I wanted to encourage you through it today. It's time now to open your heart. VeryWellFamily.com published online that special needs is an umbrella term for a wide array of diagnoses from those that revolve, excuse me, that resolve quickly to those that will be a challenge for life and those that are relatively mild to those that are profound. It covers developmental delays, medical conditions, psychiatric conditions, and congenital, congenital conditions that require accommodations so children can reach their potential. No matter the reason, the designation is useful. It can help you obtain needed services, set appropriate goals, and gain an understanding of your child and the stresses your family may face. 
Special needs, though, are commonly defined by why a child, what a child can't do. Milestones unmet. Foods banned, activities avoided, or experiences denied. These hinder hindrances can hit families hard and make special needs seem like a tragic, tragic designation. There is no protective barrier that can protect all children everywhere. Some will suffer and cannot survive without our unconditional generosity, love, patience, medical and research genius, and financial backing. After the break, we're going to meet a woman who embodies a generous and creative spirit that not only thinks outside the box, but what she cannot, what she cannot do with the box to help children in need. She's more than a teacher. At her school, she wears the designation of International Baccalaureate Program Coordinator at Poe Middle School in Fairfax County, Virginia, which she will decode during her own introduction. But wait, 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 there's more. And you're going to hear this. She lives in the concept that impossible is merely a word to describe the degree of difficulty. She's chosen to title her show, Paying It Forward. I want you to stay close now. And we are back. I would love to present to many of you and introduce to others, Ms. Mish Peters. And uh, I'm going to hand it over to her because she's got a story and can't anybody tell it better than she can. Hi, Mish. Hey there. How are you doing? I am great. You're back. I love I it. I am. But, you know, I'm so upset. I just found something out since the last time we spoke. That's only two days. I know. And, uh, you know, life happens really fast, especially when you're out there being an inquirer in the world, not letting the grass go under your feet, right? So I was with our friend Jessica, who we spoke with last time. Yeah. And she and I were talking about, like, the human trafficking issue. Right. And we were speaking about how there is actually an app that is out there right now, which there's always an app for everything, that actually helps people find companies, businesses, things like that, that are allegedly partaking in human trafficking activities. So it's become a commodity using social media. Well, that or maybe it's even just an educational warning so you don't go to those businesses. But I guess okay. what has me so perplexed, Tyra, uh -huh. and I don't know the answer to this question, so I don't want to be accusatory in my tone by any mean, but it just seems to me like if there's an app identifying these locations, why are there's not the SWAT team out there gotcha. shutting these places down if there's an app for that? I got it. I got it. You know, it has me so perplexed and so upset and then, you know, being the fact that I had these thoughts, and again, you have to think, you know, I was kind of like talking about it. We found out a lot of it is, has to do with the lack of funding within our own police, you know, our community systems that support stopping these things. Right, right. I guess there's only like maybe one or two people in the Fairfax County Police Force. Now, I did talk to uh, someone who was there and has since started a nonprofit, and he did say minimal handful of people focusing on this at any one time it has me so upset so you think one or two people overwhelmed in what they're doing I can only imagine I can't yeah. even imagine how overwhelming it would be but then to find out there's this app for it which is actually guiding them to where they need to go if right. indeed it's real right okay and like I said I'm not you know I don't know but it just has me so perplexed because I think to myself as a community I mean, there's so many things that we should be telling people, our leaders, about right. to how to spend monies and, like, everything else. But I think to myself, this is such an issue. We have such a problem in this area. It is such a hot topic as far as concern. And it's out there. And we should be doing something more about letting our community leaders know that we need some more support out there to shut these places down and get them out of our community. I think what... What you're also talking about is where we place our values. Right. And um, you get what you invest in. Absolutely. Now, a couple of things. After we talked, mm -hmm. um, I was reading uh, some follow-up mm -hmm. research, 
and it was saying this northern Virginia in the United States is a magnet. We've got three airports. Mm -hmm. We've got trains. Mm -hmm. We've got buses. We've got trucks. We have a communication system, and we're diverse. We are the prime place for human trafficking. Mm -hmm. But the other thing we talked about on Monday was there are a lot of people that don't understand, one, what it really is because they're thinking it's happening in Cambodia and other places. Which they don't, it is. Yeah, but they don't understand how severe it is right here and what we have to do if we're talking about having another generation, mm-hmm. a healthy one, a non-stressed, depressed, PTSD group of children, mm-hmm. we have to flip the switch and get the information out. Right. I that hasn't that information is um, it hasn't gotten to my heart yet because I'm having a visceral response. I, I'm with you there, but I had to share it because I was just. I'm glad you did. About it. I'm glad you did, and I hope anybody, everybody listening is going what? Right. And I hope that they're googling sex trafficking and find out what really exists right here. Mm-hmm. So, or maybe it's inspiring somebody who has access to something that can do something about it like money you know funding yes influence yes influence like i said we influence. had time treasure and talents right yes. those are the three factors last time we talked right and so maybe there's some people out there that have those three things that they can contribute to help solve that problem that's true that's you true know? so so there's hope there's always hope uh i think it it is important for us however to to shine light when we can absolutely and and so speaking of shining light, you are a shining light. Hmm. <laughs> and um, I first I first met Mish at a, I saw her present at a Rotary function, and she would just let little things slip here and there <laughs> about what she did. And I said, wait a minute, I need more co- I need more of her. I need more conversation. So thank you for coming back. And please think of yourself as a human library book. Okay. And have our listening audience hear your preface to the extent that they want to keep turning the pages and learning more about you. Who are you? Oh, who am I not? Okay. Right? Yes. Okay, so let's start there. I mean, I feel so blessed because I am someone who grew up in a family of um, kind of rebellious thinking, thinking over open mindedness, right? So my grandparents were dairy farmers Uh my other set of grandparents were miners out in the west wow oregon trail Uh um you know i come from such diversity myself as a first generation second generation american on one side and a been here since the mayflower on the other side Mm -hmm. um but you know i think what i'm really most proud of that explains a lot of the facets to my purpose or mission in life and what i'm doing is the fact that I grew up in a family where, you know, my dad was a first generation Peace Corps member. Okay. Um, you know, everyone in my family has a vowel profession, whether it's educator, you know, military, you know, armed forces mm-hmm. or, um, you know, agriculture with farming. So mm-hmm. like, you know, I take really part, you know, a lot of pride in knowing that I come from stock that are doers that think mm-hmm. who have trials and tribulations, but kind of rise through it and do something for their community. I mean, I grew up, you know, with that philosophy. I grew up here in a church at St. Matthew's United Methodist Church here in Fair in Annandale. And I grew up with the mentality of like, you know, as a Christian, if you see someone in need, do something about it. And if you can't do something about it, find somebody who can. Don't just let it go by. That's your out of the box and oh by the way, what do I do with the box thinking? Right. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I was just raised with that and I'm so blessed, you know, from, you know, going on vacations when my parents were big tra- world travelers and so we we never went to the chalets and the resorts. We always took trips around what we were learning next year in school. You know, oh, like fun. it was World War II. My parents took us to Germany. We went to Dachau mm-hmm. and Auschwitz yeah. and learned the real thing, you know. Or, um, you know, we did a lot of service, you know, in our church with going to Appalachia and building houses or doing soup kitchens over the holidays. Uh-huh. So, you know, I, that's just how I became. That's your became. DNA. It's just part of. Yeah. I don't know anything else. I hear you. I'm so blessed, yes, right? Yes, you are. Um, but, you know, uh, you know, with, with all that came a lot of trials and tribulations. I also, I grew up and I have a few people very special to me in my family who 
um, had significant learning disabilities okay. um, and cognitive disabilities. And so I kind of grew up as, as someone who was a caregiver for those around me who had disabilities. So that was, again, a part of who I was becoming, mm -hmm. where I became an advocate to stand up. Um, there's you know, someone very close to me in my family I can remember in school, teachers kind of chastising this family member and I overheard it and I remember going to my family going this is not okay mm -hmm. and being an advocate right then and there mm -hmm. when I probably should have been a little scared to do it you know I don't think so but it was the right thing to do <laughs> yes you know and then I think you know like the other pieces is, is I'm also an orphan uh, my sister and I lost my parents very young on my 16th birthday I found out my mother had breast cancer and then uh, my father died when I was 19, and then my mother died five years later from that. And so then it's just my sister and I left over. So we really kind of had this really untraditional life of kind of surviving. And now that I'm a little older and I have my godchildren and my nieces and nephews that are that age, when I lost my parents, I think, oh, my gosh, we are so young. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, my parents gave us that good foundation to be survivors and to get that grit to do something and I have a great family other than you mm -hmm. know that I have still have that's supportive I have friends that have become family you know it's just who I am it's you are am. you are you are you and one <laughs> part of you is teacher mm -hmm. one part of you is mentor one part of you is survivor this is what I'm hearing mm -hmm. one part of you is coach one part of you is advocate and if I put that in a bowl and stirred it up, what do I get? What's an inter international baccalaureate <laughs> program coordinator for middle school? That's a lot. It is. It's a big title. But really what it is is, you know, for, for 15 years or so, I was a special education teacher in Fairfax County. Okay. And so that's what I did. Before I was a teacher, though, I actually worked in the field of psychiatry. And I worked as a program manage or manager um, and, th and recreational therapist for residential and uh, uh, clinical settings for people with brain injuries, spinal injuries, and psychiatric issues. Okay. And so I was a career switcher, went into teaching, which was really my passion, still is, obviously. Yes, it is. And then uh, when I was at the school I was at, I kind of got linked into the International Baccalaureate Program because of their focus on community and service and okay. making service learning part of the education. And I really loved that because I really think it's especially in special education, service learning has such a great place because it's very hands-on, it's very authentic, it's very real world. And those are all things, that especially learners that have difficulties with traditional types of teaching mm -hmm. can really grasp onto and it's sticky and it's messy and it's just what they need to do what they gotta do. So you're still, you're taking all the skills you bring to the table and delivering them through a program mm -hmm. uh, with a special target audience. Right. Okay, I like that. Go ahead. So, and I, what I think the what was really cool with that experience was is that really brought my students, who were typically kind of like that that group of kids at school where people were kind of sometimes scared of them. They call them them. Them. Uh huh. And because of the leadership they were developing and being able to see them contributing and doing real life beneficial things for their school, they got accepted. And suddenly they were like, ki other kids were like, oh, yeah, let us help you with that. And it kind of like changed the whole community at our school. And so, like, with that, with the international baccalaureate stuff came like just like that clo global feeling of it and mm -hmm. like taking, um, you know, the, like I said, the school. I'm at is very internationally diverse and so like it was just going out finding like those little snippets of authentic real problems that are happening in the world to bring them to kids right mm -hmm. and that allowed that program allows me to do that give an example a specific example of, of something you focused on a unit or something you focused on with the kids and sure like so the first um, the first kind of big thing we did as when I was a community service leader is we did we integrated um, a World War II unit with doing a food drive. And so we, we kind of talked about during that time, it was the history of the Depression and World War I, World War II, and that whole concept of, of that community coming together to take care of each other. And so soup kitchens were then created during the uh, 
the depression. Mm -hmm. And so the kids kind of talked about like that, that social security aspect of it all. Okay. And so then the kids started like, well, let's do like a canned food drive. And then we got math involved with measuring, Mm -hmm. you know, and making it a competition that was really fun. And so we kind of started out with that. Well, then they were, then we started talking about the global aspect of how that, um, that there is, you know, such a need around the world about hunger. And so we kind of started with this Hunger Games before there was the movie The Hunger Games. Mm-hmm. And the kids really learned about, you know, the effects of weather and government and politics on food security around the world. And so the kids did research on that. And so then some of them would go to their own countries that they came from or some of our kids were in refugee camps coming and speaking to the kids going, oh, yeah, I never knew when my I'd go two or three days without eating. And they would tell their peers about it, you know. And so then we would actually do things. And so we we started with a canned food drive, and that was for our own community. Then uh, we did a field trip where we did learning about science and watershed, and we went out to the Shenandoah, and we had the kids there create an organic garden Mm -hmm. where then that that produce was then given to the people of poverty in that area, so they had fresh produce. So I'm hearing a lot of excitement the process, I remember when I was teaching, we called it uh, interdisciplinary, thematic. We mm-hmm. had those kind of words where you could bring in all the disciplines. But what I love is the outcome you're discussing. Mm-hmm. The outcome is realistic. These children can deposit mm-hmm. something of themselves right. and see the result. Mm-hmm. So so h- how did you get to Africa? Well, then that's okay. So then with all this food security stuff that <laughs> yes. can happen, we, um, I, you know, Sudan was in the news, South yes. Sudan yes. and Lost Boys and whatnot. And the IB coordinator at my school before I was a coordinator uh, came to me and said, you should read this book, God Grew Tired of Us. And it was a great story about these Lost Boys from Sudan. And I kind of was reading it and I was at my best, you know, one of my best friend's uh, parents' houses and he was a, a past different district governor of the Rotary and I would say he's like my godfather. And he uh, literally kept them saying, me, she should do this rotary, this rotary. Um, tell, tell everybody what rotary is. Okay. So rotary is a community service organization. It's international. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's just something that like all of the communities around, around the world have clubs and club members that have all sorts of different professions that come together and basically do good around the world. You and know, in order to stay in that space, the motto is service above self. Mm-hmm. It's over 130 some years old. Mm-hmm. Footnote, it was a bunch of businessmen mm-hmm. until 1987 mm-hmm. yep. when the Supreme Court said, you can't do that. You got to mm-hmm. let the ladies in. Yep. And since then, we're exploding. Yeah. I mean, it's really is a, a phenomenal organization. And so, you know, Pat kept on saying, you know, Mish, do this, do this. You're reading this book on Sudan. They're going to Southern Africa this year. And I was just like, oh, okay, that's cool. I've always wanted to see an elephant in the wild, you know, like whatever, you know. And I went to my principal because it was during the school year. Mm-hmm. And uh, she and the IB coordinator was just like, you know, this is a great opportunity. And so they gave me a leave of absence to actually leave school a month early and go as long as I agreed that whatever I, whenever I came back, I had to do something with it okay. for, for our school. So you went with a group mm-hmm. from Rotary to Sudan to South Africa. Oh, to South Africa. Yeah. Yep. This was because I was reading a book on Sudan. So oh, I'm Africa sorry. Africa Connection. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, we went to South Africa and, and Swaziland. I guess I should call it Eswatini now. They changed their name Eswatini, last month. Eswatini, yes. Last month. Um, and so we went there. And on this month-long adventure with Rotary hosting us, and I was there seeing schools and seeing all sorts of really great things, um, they took me to an orphanage, which kind of, you know, of course, hit my heart, knowing that, you know, I've lost my parents. I can only imagine how hard it was. And I noticed that some of the kids there appeared to have some learning issues. Okay. Right? And Mm -hmm. I thought, where do you go to school? Because so far I'd only really seen schools that were, I would say, like more private schools. Mm -hmm. Right? Uniforms and and that whole thing. Poshy. Poshy schools. Okay. And I was just kind of like, I want to go to their school. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I went to the Rotary and I said, "I, I need to go to that school because that's my kind of school these schools I'm going to are not my school I need to do something okay and so I went it was just over the hill so I went there and the teachers were on strike and some kids were sitting there and wheelchairs and all sorts of things in the hot sun they show up for school there's no one teaching them and I thought okay I can do this and so I said what are you learning 
and they were fractions. And so I was like, okay. So I open up my notebook. I start making manipulatives out of different colored paper. Mm -hmm. I got in trouble because I was ripping up paper and I was like, it's my paper, leave me alone. <laughs> and um, started teaching them with manipulatives. Mm -hmm. And after about an hour, the kids were really getting into it and showing. And the headmaster came to me and said, show me how you did that. Oh. And I was just like, uh, I just use manipulatives, you know? And he said, okay, we usually ask for money. We usually ask for books. I want you to come back. Can you come back? And I was like, oh, yeah, sure, right? Well, you know, as that trip went on, I couldn't let it go because I thought to myself, you know, here it's a school. It's the only school for disabled children in the entire kingdom. Mm -hmm. I have, you know, I myself am an, an orphan per se. Mm -hmm. I have, you know, family members who are disabled, and I couldn't get out of my head that this could have been us in another time in another world. And yeah. I'm so thankful for the education I've received. Mm -hmm. I'm so ex I'm so blessed with the foundations and the um, even the resources my parents left me with. Okay. So I wasn't with nothing. And these kids had nothing. I mean, this is a country where HIV, there's more HIV yeah. Yeah, yeah. per capita. Right. You know, one in three families are led by children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I thought I couldn't let it go. And the Say that again. Say that again. One, one out of three families are child led. And the consequence, just, just make a picture, an audio picture for people listening that probably can't get their heads around this. When you say a family is child-led, what are you saying? I'm talking an eight-year-old who is taking care of their younger siblings. Some of them are just babies. I got you. I got you. I mean, you, how do you let that go morally? Mm -hmm. You know, and like I said earlier, being raised as that Christian to be like, if you can do something, do something. If you can't, find something. And I thought to myself... I can do something as a teacher. I'm a special education teacher. I can come here and train these teachers and do something about it. Mm -hmm. But I also need to find somebody to help me because I'm a teacher and I can't just fly to South Africa. Exactly. Will so what, what happened then? So I went back after this trip. I went to Rotary and I said, I need your help. I've got to do this. And I didn't do it alone. Um, you know, I have a, a, a co-founder, with Dr. Lois Wilson, who's a dentist, who's also a Rotarian, and she... We're a 50-50 partnership, and we went to our clubs, and so far we have had nothing but overwhelming support from our clubs and from our district here mm -hmm. in Virginia where we started this Michelot program. And so this program, it, it, it has started from just doing educator training to 10 years later. We've been there every year. We've brought teachers groups of teachers, four or five teachers, to Eswatini mm -hmm. to do educator training. We've brought teachers from Eswatini to America for training. Wonderful. We have um, the now dentist. This is 10 years, right? Oh, yeah, 10-year process. Okay. We now have uh, a dental program. So we run, I think, three or four years. We've run free dental health care th services for the entire school and village that we provide services for the kids there because otherwise they would just be ignored dental health i think there's only like five dentists in the entire country wow so going to the dentist is a luxury yeah so yeah, most yeah. of it's taken care of at home well yeah. you don't have anyone at home to take care of your teeth yeah you're in a lot of pain a lot so of the time. so you were teaching them as well hygiene mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. were you also providing the toothbrushes toothpaste mm -hmm. and, and this is that blessing you know i i don't know i i don't have the money to buy 500 toothbrushes so again, you go out and you find your supports, right? And so I went out. So not only was Rotary a support, my church up the street, St. Matthew's was a support. I mean, they, they give me ditty bags every year that has a toothbrush, toothpaste, deodorant, soap, all of those things that we give to every child that needs one in, in Switzerland. Wow. You know, I've got people all over the country, you know, friends, people just randomly, you know, really help us out because they know 100% of what they're giving. Is, is going, going towards mm -hmm. it. There's no processing fee. There's no like whatever, you know, whatever. So it's, it's been such a blessing. And, you know, here it is 10 years later. And um, I was lucky enough with Fairfax County, again, being very supportive um, in my, in my administration at Poe being a, incredibly supportive where um, I took an extended leave of absence from school. And I was an invitation. I was uh, brought back to Eswatini by invitation of the ministry of education there where I implemented you know, behavior modifications and disability training kingdom wide for four months, you know, and so I got to live up there and, and experience, you know, a, something in my life that I never thought I would experience. 
Be the miracle. Be the miracle. I'm telling you. And and it's just like it, it's the miracle about that is it doesn't stop. I mean, I it just didn't stop with Eswatini. I mean, I had a Rotary Club down in Fredericksburg invite me to go to Honduras one year to go. And you went. And I went, of course, to do the same thing, mm-hmm. to work with schools. I had um, one of the things is our, our school, we did this pen pal ship talking about how the community service started where our Spanish our people who are our students who are learning Spanish became pen pals with one of our employees sister schools in Guatemala mm-hmm. where they were learning English so the kids were pen palling yes via the internet and they started talking about their stories and like whatever learning Spanish and English and sharing mm-hmm. and our kids at our school were like we need to do something for them they don't even have a school library and so they found all these books in Spanish and and English and, you know, it was really great because we're trying to figure out a way to, to get the books there. Right. And it was so expensive to ship. And I went to my Rotary Club and said, hey, help me out. Well, it was, we found out it was like a $200 plane ticket to Guatemala. And they were like, well, fly to Guatemala. So I filled two <laughs> suitcases with 50 pounds worth of books each, flew to Guatemala, and then flew home. And went and delivered and created a library for $200 in Guatemala because of the inspiration of kids and that's what I just love about being a teacher is because you you're constantly inspired by the just the amazing thought process of what an 11 12 and 13 year old can think of because there's no boundaries with that and I love it It, I love it because they come here with everything they need Mm -hmm. to save the world everything and I remember uh, I had several different teaching assignments but I taught first grade, my first teaching assignment, and to, and we taught phonics, which is now remediation. Mm-hmm. And I remember watching these babies realize that C-A-T cut, became a word. Mm-hmm. Then you couldn't shut them up. They were reading the walls. They were reading everything. And, and you know, Miss Garlington, da-da-da-da-da. And I'm like, yes, baby, I know. Could we just, no, Miss Garlington, read this, read this. And to see their eyes, mm-hmm. and that means that they're okay for the rest of their lives. Yes. Yeah. They can you've re- changed, you've made generational change oh. by teaching someone how to read and do ba- basic math, you know? Yeah. And that's why I feel about every time I'm in Africa and I see the change that these kids have made over the last 10 years because at this point, like, they're my children. I hear you. You know, they are really legitimately, like, how old? Are, how, how old is your starter group now? Would they be able to oh, reinvest? Some, oh, like, my son, Justin... I call him my son because, of course, he was the naughtiest boy on campus, <laughs> and that's who gravitates towards me. And he, you know, for many years he couldn't read anything, and so he and I just worked and worked and worked. And he just, when I was there last year, had moved on and is now becoming a welder. And he's a welder, and he's going to school to become a welder. And I thought to myself, if you'd said ten years ago, yeah, nobody had any faith in what he could be, and he probably would have been roaming the streets. Yeah, right. And and it just that broke my heart because. There's potential in all of us. All of us, yes. Every single one of us has potential yes. in something. We just have to find what that is. And you started out when we were complaining about uh, how to be game changers in a world where sex trafficking is. And you said, what do we do? What do we do? And you found by asking. And one of the components is a club that we both love, Rotary International, mm-hmm. and they now have helped future generations with an S mm-hmm. because teach one, teach one, teach one. Mm-hmm. And so, well, okay, I'm excited. I know everybody's proud of you and excited. Um, if I gave you a blank check right now, no. If I made you more of a superwoman than you are, <laughs> what would you do to make what you want to do grow and prosper? Oh my goodness, you know, dream big. I know. I, you know, like I, I just kind of figure I'm never, I never want to stop learning because okay. I learn every day from something, someone, and if if I'm at somewhere and I'm not learning something, then I'm finding something to learn. So, you know, I would love to, I would, I would love to become, I would love to have a PhD in international education, where then I can use that to go around the world to be a a real advocate because I'm finding that I love what I'm doing. So, you know, I had the opportunity during spring break, this last spring break, it was kind of a spontaneous trip where I was invited by the U.S. Embassy there to speak on autism. 
And so I went and in, spent in in where Vietnam. <laughs> oh, in Vietnam. Yeah. So. Oh, you mean? I know. Yeah. yeah. You know. So you know. <laughs> Down the street. I guess. Yeah. It. No, but it was such a blessing because it was just one of these things where the stars seemed to align. And I really feel like this is, it's like the universe or karma or God or whoever. Somebody is making a plan always. And I think all these little factors go into place to making all these things happen, right? And paying it forward. So that way, you know that what you're doing is paying it forward to the next, right. you know, whether it's myself or somebody else, I don't care who it is, mm -hmm. as long as it's, it's affecting someone to do greater good in the world somewhere, somehow, you know? And so, yeah, I, I was just talking to a friend of mine who then spoke to a friend of his, and she is in international education, and she was just like, Mish, would you come Would you come to Vietnam to talk about autism? And I was like, sure, right? Never thought it would actually really happen. And then it just happened. And, you know, I've, I, there's so much. My Lord, it looks like you need to come here several times. <laughs> I want to put a comma there because one of the notes I made I wanted you to talk about just briefly is the autism mm -hmm. spectrum. Mm -hmm. And because it's in the news so much and the whole immunization, da 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 mm. da So where do you land in that space? What, how, what are you advocating in the, in the world of autism. What did you say when you went to Vietnam? <laughs> well, you know, there's just so many questions about autism. And I honestly, I won't pretend to have the answers. I'm not a doctor. I'm mm -hmm. not a scientist. I'm not someone who's doing research on it, other than the fact that practical research, right? Mm -hmm. And I really feel like with any, any child, regardless of disability, mm -hmm. we need to focus on people's abilities. I agree. Because again, we can focus on the negative, but the negative doesn't get us anywhere it doesn't get us moving anywhere. Right, right. But what we do need to do is we need to focus on what they, what people can do, mm -hmm. regardless of what their label is, mm -hmm. and take that and run with it. Okay. Of course, you need to keep in some consideration with the struggles that people have, obviously. You know, yeah. like, that's obvious. And, and as far as research, I mean, there's, you know, there's one research on vaccinations that'll then say the opposite. Right, you know, right. Like whatever, that's what I've been so, hearing. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know what the answer to that is. But I do know that... From a perspective of, you know, having family members with aut autism, loving a lot of people with autism, having students with autism, I really feel like, you know, I don't know what the answer is and what, what the prevalence, what's, you know, what, what is out there. Is it in greater numbers than it really was or is are we just finally identifying it? I don't know the answer to that question, but I do know this. The human brain is ever-evolving. And the problem is, is our society and our educational system hasn't really caught up with that. Right? Uh -huh. So I feel like so many times children, it's like we're born in a Vegas situation anymore, right? From the time kids are born, they're so overstimulated all the time oh, with yeah. sounds, noises, technology. Yeah. Yes, yes. You know, 50 years ago, you didn't have any of that, right? So you had downtime and your head can relax and all that kind of stuff. And like, there's got to be something to that. And we just have not, as a society, caught up to that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so I don't know what the answer to that is, but I know that, that I can advocate for every child to have every possibility that they should have the right to have. And that's what I did like in Vietnam. I just advocated for those kids' rights to have opportunity and to not put barriers in front of people because they deserve better. Mm -hmm. We all deserve better because mm -hmm. we have all, we, every single one of us have something we can contribute Absolutely. to this world. Absolutely. And just because we might not be able to see it doesn't mean it's not there. It's our job to explore what that is. Exactly. Open that up, expose it, and make it happen. Um, we had, I, I came back here a couple of years ago from Florida and, and we had, Rotary Camp Florida, mm -hmm. and it's supported by all the Rotary Clubs, and what it is is a camp for children with special needs, and we supply the environment, and the organizations bring the children. Well, we uh, partnered with Kaboom to create. They wanted a playground, and we called in the children, and we had them dream. What did they want? Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the little children that had autism said, don't paint it yellow. And that was so heavy because somebody, okay, what's wrong with yellow? You know, that's a rotary color. Well, it's not that comfortable. It's an adjutant for a child with autism. And so uh, we asked them what kind of things they wanted, and they said, well, we want to be able to feel like we can walk. 
when we get to this place. And like you said, it's listening. And we created that. We created that mm-hmm. playground for them. 3,000 volunteers mm-hmm. in nine hours built a playground. Wow. And then we brought the children in. And they are so enthusiastic. Mm-hmm. And they they have a story to tell, and I'm still trying to figure out how to do that. Is it in a book or what have you? Mm-hmm. But what my question is, when you went to Vietnam, it had to be difficult to move past stereotypes in order to advocate, right? Or was there not? Oh, there's always there's always stereotypes. So who was your audience it, when you were there? Um, I had everybody between. There were government officials, there okay. were parents, there okay. were teachers, there were just community members who wanted to learn more. Um, there but were, all there these were people wanted to learn. Yeah, so they it, it was okay. all like an open welcome thing. Okay. You know, the one thing I do know is there's stereotypes in every country that you're at. So anybody who's different, anybody who looks different, has a different flavor, whatever mm-hmm. it is. Mm-hmm. There's always a stereotype that goes with it, no matter where you are. That's I mean, true. There, there are stereotypes. I'm fly, I'm fighting in Africa all the time. You know, whether it be Malawi, South Africa, you know, I've been to Jamaica, Honduras, Guatemala, Vietnam, Virginia. Mm-hmm. There's always stereotypes, and there's always fears that people have because of someone being different. Yes, yes. And yes. to me, I guess that's where I feel the most passionate because I feel that it is my responsibility and it's my calling. To show people that there is nothing to fear in differences in people because we are all different. None of us are the same. You know, But you of, have to have exposure and access. You do. And you have to have that example and that modeling. Yes, yes. And so that's something like, you know, when I was in Vietnam, Jamaica, you know, Southern Africa, wherever I am, I make a point of going and making sure that people in the community, they see me holding hands with the kids. Yeah. They see me hugging them. They see me not being fearful of them because, you know, there's just that misconception, culturally speaking, that sometimes they really feel like it's a curse or mm-hmm. it's something they can catch. It's a disease. And mm-hmm. it's like, it's not a disease. It's not that because, I mean, I know that. Mm-hmm. I can prove that. But that's something you have to prove to them. And Absolutely. if I can be that person, I'm willing to be. And you are. And that's... <laughs> That's why I'm so excited to have you sitting across from me now. Um, all kinds of things are going through my head. You know, okay, what's the graphic novel we're going to write as a result <laughs> of this? Can I go next time? And um, I hope that we hear from our audience with ideas because this is an open forum. Oh, that would be great. And uh, you're listening to someone who, like I said, be the miracle uh, she touched my heart. Her story resonated with me. And, yeah, you're going to hear from her again. You are. Uh, we can't let this just go by. But um, those of you who listened last week know that she had an assignment as a teacher last week. She did not do. But she <laughs> tells me that uh, with the second chance, she did it this time. I did. And I ask her uh, to be a giver of inspiration to her younger self. And so I'm going to ask Mish to read that letter now. Okay? Okay. I actually did it, so I'm pretty excited. Okay, babe. All right, so it says, Dear Mish, if you only knew what you know now, I'm not going to lie, so far your life has been a roller coaster. We've pretty much been trying to stand up in a hammock juggling water balloons. We've had a lot of loss and tears. We've been beaten down and bruised, and we bear many battle scars. And some were not of our own making. These events at times have paralyzed us, but we are a survivor. Breathe. This is just one of your chapters, not your whole story. We have hopefully made it through the worst of it all and have a lot of good karma coming our way. And I truly believe the universe has great things ahead. Now, with all that yucky stuff we've survived, you also need to know that we are so, so blessed. We have a family that we deeply love. We have lifelong friends that have become our family. Our faith has become our foundation for all that is to come. And I know you wanted to have a big family of your own, a house full of kids, a dog, a husband, but the universe did not have that in, the, in your hand of cards. The universe had bigger plans for you. We have godchildren, cousins, nieces, and nephews to share traditions with and who will love you as much as you adore them. Take every moment to be present in their lives. 
put the phone away, talk with them on road trips, take them camping, call them, text them love messages out of the blue, show up at their soccer games and volleyball games, take them to the movies, talk to them about the books they're reading, or better yet, read the books they're reading. It'll all be worth it. They will grow up to know that they are loved and cherished by you, and they will love and cherish you back. You will have children all around the world who call you Ma. You will be a role model to young people in Eswatini, Malawi, Peru, Guatemala, Honduras, Jamaica, Vietnam, and Virginia. You will especially use your scars to empower others to learn how actions impact others, how a trial or tribulation meant to break you can make you stronger because you survived it and you learned from it. You will find that all those norms that society put on you were lies. You will find happiness being a, an explorer in life. You don't need a superhero to save you because you saved yourself. You will have friends and family all around the world and you will have seen elephants in the wild more times than you can count, seen natural wonders of the world, been to ancient landmarks, but more importantly, you will share all of these things with your global, global children to show them that there is more out there than what they are told. Most importantly, you have found a personal mission and real purpose in life. You will be an advocate, a voice to those who sometimes don't have one, showing love to those who've been taught to hide, those who've been taught to be ashamed of who they are. You will educate communities around the world in accepting and embracing those with disabilities. You will show girls that there is nothing they can't do, even when society says it's impossible for a, woman to do, for a woman to do that. You will show men how to fix toilets, how to build shelves, how to fix a car, when they say you couldn't because you were a woman. You will teach parents and teachers that corporal punishment is not the only way to manage a person's behavior. You will fight community leaders to stand up for what is right. They will tell you to give up and that you cannot handle the storm and you will whisper back, I am the storm. You will be David against a Goliath, and you will win. You will survive this because your parents, your parents blessed you with grit. You were provided a solid foundation of education and empathy, and you have a stellar support system. You've taken all the mud thrown at you and created a beautiful walled garden of possibility with the support and love of your family and friends. However, don't do what I did. Don't lock people out because of fear. Build a door that is, okay, hold on. Build a door that in your garden to invite people in when you are ready. We have recently learned to forgive those who are not sorry and accept apologies you've never received, and that has been difficult. However, you've been given a reason to trust again. Trust yourself, trust your abilities, and know that you are perfectly imperfect. Continue to work hard be honest and live with integrity. You will always be humble and loyal, and that is what makes you different from so many. Don't wait as long as I did to let people in and to help you and to love you. It will be worth it, I promise. The habits you created to survive will no longer serve you when it's time to thrive. Get out of survival mode. New habits, new life. Accept what has been, let go of what was, and have faith in what will be. Be silly, be fun, laugh, sleep outside, and tell people how you feel about them. You've had way more happy days than bad ones. Stand close to people who feel like sunshine and get excited about seeing the stars at night. And remember, not all of the storms you have survived have come to destroy you. Some have come to clear your path. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mish Peters. Thank you for your presence, your commitment your spirit. Thank you for being you. It occurred to me that <clears throat> some somebody out there may want to give you a call or email you and talk about the things you're doing. How do they do that? Well, we have a website, Michela, the Michelo Project, um, and obviously uh, you can reach me through Fairfax County Public Schools at mspeters.fcps.edu. All right. Did you hear that? She is reachable. I want to uh, remind you that there are moments during the day, during the week, where uh, you need a little snack for your spirit. I'm going to leave you with a couple of things. Uh, the most important, of course, is the fact that you're worthy and that you are not your circumstance. 
that you have everything you need inside of you to be who you were created to be. And there is absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing that has happened to you, the good, the bad, or the scary, that will be wasted. Most importantly, please understand I'm here and I'm listening. And your seat is guaranteed at the table. I look so forward to our next time. You take really good care, and I'm going to have Mr. Tony Walker take us out on piano.